Julian and Dad, it's good to have you guys here. Hey, we're pretty happy to be here in Nashville talking about this. Yeah, pleasure. Julian, Hello. the elusive Peterson, finally cornered into a podcast. <laughs> I know, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. It takes a lot of work to corner him. <laughs> A lot of work. I yeah. think, yeah, I don't know if this was cornering, I think. Yeah, the least cornerable Peterson, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, and that might be saying something. <laughs> Who's the most cornerable Peterson? Elliot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For now. For now, for now. For we'll now. See, yeah. 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 <laughs> Good one. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, uh, so today. Yeah, it's not my dad. It's not your dad. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Elliot. It's not Scarlett. No. <laughs> it's Elliot for yeah. now. For now, yeah. For now. Uh, uh, so today we're going to talk about essay mainly. And then I'm also going to throw in some questions because I think people are dying to know every, like, everything about you. <laughs> well, good luck. Well, he is <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, he is interesting, you know. Okay, Julian. Yes. Why did it take you so long to agree to talk to me <laughs> over the interweb? Um, well, I like, I like my privacy. I've always liked my privacy, but I think that's most of it. I don't really have a lot of interest in being a public person. Um, if I am public in any way, then I generally, well, I, I'm quite sure that I prefer it to be about something that I've done. And I didn't really feel like I had done anything <laughs> oh, <laughs> that wow. was particularly, you know, useful, let's say, to talk about to other people. Um, and so, you know, I, I have a really nice life and I like my little family and my, um, you know, the fact that it's relatively contained from, from the world. And, you know, I don't really ever want to give that up, but I do have interest in sharing things that I've done that I feel like are going to be meaningful for for other people, whether that is, well, this application, which I'm really proud of, or, um, well, the album that I released last year, although I didn't really talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's why mostly is, is I, I'm, you wanted to wait till you had something to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem in your position is that people would be interested in you in some sense for peripheral reasons. For sure. Yeah. And you could certainly, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and you could sate that demand if you felt like it, but it seems to me that waiting until you have something. I don't feel like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 No kidding. Yeah. Uh, and it's been good to see that your life has been protected from all the storms that have gathered around us. And that, that was a good decision, I think. So, and this is a good thing to talk about because this app is, it could help a lot of people. Yeah. Well, and then we should talk a little bit about it's testing too. One of the things I realized years ago and, and had drummed into my head as well by people who have built successful software programs and marketed them is that you should be in dialogue with your audience, your customer base, let's say, while you're building it. You don't build something and then launch it and hope everyone buys it. You have to be testing it step by step with the market, with the environment to see if not only do you have the ideas right, but you have them right at the right time in a way that can be communicated to people that they will want to purchase and will purchase. And so you tested this with the Acton Academy, for example. Yeah. For, yeah. So we tested this with a, like a number of different groups over the last couple of years um, with private groups on Reddit, with people who signed up to test it with people, with students, MBA students at the Acton Academy um, using usertesting.com groups, you know, we, we tested it constantly as we were, as we were building it to make sure that our design was consistent, that people understood what it was for. Um, and many times they didn't, <laughs> which is well, often what you find when you test software. Um, yeah, well you, which is you good, get, obviously. you get familiar with it and then you think it's obvious because it's now obvious to you, but it's interesting watching people often use a piece of software that you've designed and see where they don't get it. Yeah, isn't and that what they did with uh, what, the, one of the first Macintosh computers, right? They, uh, they would bring 
grandmothers, I think, people over 60 to, to come in and they would just put them in front of an Apple computer. Right. And, you know, not tell them anything. They would just say, use this thing. Yeah. And, you know, they'd pick up the keyboard and like do all sorts of stuff with it. And Could it they was, figure it out? Put, they'd try to find well, the sometimes. key. Right. They did. They do all sorts of things. Right. But that was that was how they did the testing. Right. You'd either either you're supposed to give people a task or you just want to see they naturally interact with it. Um, and we did we did both of those things and and, yeah, and you well, have made to, a lot of improvements. You based have on to be aware of the assumption that um, people should be smart enough to know how to use this. It's like, no, if they can't use it, it's yeah. because it's a stupid design. It's yeah, not for because sure. the, if people were just a little smarter, they could figure this out. It's like. Yeah, that's good luck. Good. No that's money. how you fail. Yeah. 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 That's how you sell then, your product to three software engineers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. And they, yeah, they want to use it just because they want to show how smart they are. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a very bad design philosophy. It's if, if someone can't use it, it's your fault. It's the right attitude in business. That's why it's that not is, so much. Yeah. It's like yeah. websites when every single website has a formula and looks the same and one other website is... Oh, no, 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 that logo or that button should go in this other corner. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the modern internet, right? Like is, is that everything looks the same because, yeah. well, then people can use it. Right. You build in redundancy. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, and you violate conventions at your peril. You know, we could have insisted that everybody use a Dvorak keyboard for this writing program. And that's a way more efficient keyboard because the letters, the alphabet letters are spaced for optimal speed when you type. But you don't see people using Dvorak keyboards. Well, one of our developers did. Start. Yeah, what? <laughs> what is this type of... I was nodding along like I knew what you were talking about, but I don't. There's well, a keyboard that's more effective? Oh, oh way more, more effective, effective, yeah. Well, yeah, what? because... At what? least no, we're not telling you about it because you have to keep learning using no, QWERTY. Here. I'm yeah. Googling it right after <laughs> yeah. this. The QWERTY keyboard was developed at least in part to slow you down when you type. Because yeah, for typewriters, right? With the old yeah. mechanical typewriters, yeah. before electric typewriters, the keys would jam if people got too fast. So they slowed them down. Yeah. So now we use a keyboard that artificially makes typing so difficult. So what's the other one look like? The most, the common, most common letters, letters are together. Or where they should yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, like on a QWERTY keyboard, the most common letters are spaced out as much as they can be. Because I can yeah. type really fast. I'm very proud of my typing. I can type really fast. Yeah. Do you think it would be worth a <laughs> well, well, it doesn't learning look this like other it one? Because people... People There'd be a struggle at the beginning. Up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You, you'd have to re-automatize your. <laughs> but yeah, topic. yes, yes, it would be faster eventually. Yes. Would it For, save me time if you add up all the time yes, you spent I learning, think, and then yes, I think I'm doing it, it. Yeah, I think it would. But can you buy computers like that, like MacBooks? You can buy keyboards like that. Well, you you can't buy separate, that. You'd have to have a separate MacBooks keyboard. With, what's the what's this called? Oh, Dvorak is one. D V O R A K. Yeah, it just cool. rings off the tongue. You know. It's yeah, Dvorak. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm going to ask some fun questions too. Are you ready? It's going to involve Julian talking a bunch. Hopefully. Okay. Uh, shifts let's... uncomfortably in his seat. <laughs> <laughs> that even made me shift uncomfortably. Well, I'm waiting to see what happens. Well, it shouldn't make you shift uncomfortably. Oh, you might say something embarrassing. I know what I do. I'm actually not that worried about that. Hopefully you'll do that on purpose if it happens. Oh, yeah, not with any luck. Yeah. Uh, what has been the biggest challenge of having dad shoot to fame yeah well there have been a ton of challenges benefits and challenges um i think mostly well, there's a couple of things you know it, it it gets you involved in a battle that isn't your own which is interesting right because of the way that that you became popular which is about you know political topics and philosophical topics that were contentious generally um and so then people start to assume that, you know, you hold the same opinions as your father, which to a certain extent I do, obviously, right? Like, I mean, there's some things that, uh, and plenty of things that we're aligned on and, but there's always, you know, you never have the same views as your father. I mean, if you do, then you need to think more probably because... Well, you're generationally you know, different and all more, sorts you of have things. My opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what she every father thinks. Essay. Yeah, this, this essay program. Uh, essay program. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so that was one of the challenges, and and well, just being being public to a certain extent. You know, people know who I am, even if I have maintained relatively private. Um, I've been asked for selfies before, which is very strange because I'm just a regular dude. <laughs> oh, assies? That's that's a selfie with an assie, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, your approach to that, I think, has been interesting. <laughs> you know, people 
people get random involved. like free yeah. guy reference i think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did that come from? it took me a second i see it was like well keep up man this is a quick moving conversation Jeez. so okay. you know, one of the things that's been that your situation has really um highlighted for me is the danger that's posed to people's mental health and maybe even to social stability when people get fixated on things that are too abstract you right. know you say well we should only pay attention to the important issues climate change for example which is about everything why aren't you worried about everything all the time and that's what you would be worried about if you were a good person it's like well no you need to parcel off a part of your life that's private that consists of the specific things that you're involved in your specific wife your specific children the specific projects like this essay. Wives well, always like to be referred to that yeah, way. Now, this do. is my specific wife. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Generic wives are a good Don't idea. Don't ask me any more questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it's a strange thing because you could be more concerned with generic wives than actually having one, you know? Yeah. So, and you, you've, you've maintained that specificity and that's made your life comparably much more peaceful and yes, productive. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, it's easy to get dragged out into the general fray and it's hard to protect yourself once that's happened. So. And, okay. Here's another one. So when, how old were you when you got married to Jill? 25. And then I when think. did you have Elliot? 26, I guess. 26, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'd say compared to the maybe. general debaucherous population, yes, you've even compared to me, <laughs> definitely compared to me you've, <laughs> you've had your you've organized your life so it from the outside anyway so well that it's hard it's hard to believe <laughs> right? well thank you like, that's a really nice compliment to, you went to university you, you got a bunch of educate what was your what did you do in university uh, i did a bachelor of arts which everyone thinks is the best thing to do yeah, yeah. That, that's uh no but i did a, i did a cool one it was uh, i went to the university of king's college in, in nova scotia and highly did a, recommended place a, yeah great university and did a, a great books program called the foundation year program um it's a one-year program where you read kind of the history of great western thought yeah. Um, and so I did that to begin with. And then I did my general degree in philosophy uh, and music. And you wrote your thesis on Heidegger and the psychedelic experience, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But so that was a common topic among students. Yeah, so. of course. <laughs> <laughs> that interface. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and the, the, you know, one of the things that's interesting, I worked with a lot of high-performing lawyers, and this was especially true of the women. They were hyper-conscientious and they were overachievers, which is a horrible word, in junior high and in high school. I think and that's then, two words. <laughs> no, it's one, it's one word. It can be. It can be hyphenated. Anyways, they were the top of their high school class. Then they were the top of their undergraduate class. Then they went to law school and they were the top of their class. And then they got picked up by a big law firm and they shot up through the ranks and became senior partners. It's one and word. Often, <laughs> no, wait, no. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> See, you need to think more like me. Yeah. And then when they got to be senior partners, they generally concluded that they didn't want to work 60 hours a week like all these other guys, and although they were women, and they wanted a more balanced life. But they had never really stepped outside of this single-minded track, you know? And it wasn't until they hit the pinnacle of what they were aiming at that they sort of woke up and realized, well, maybe this isn't what I wanted to be doing all along. And the yeah. interesting difference with you, I think, is that well, you've been organizing your life in a pretty consistent manner and in a traditional manner, I would say, you've also pursued your artistic pursuits simultaneously. And that makes it different because that's a place where you can have freedom within the context of discipline and where those things actually work very well together. Mm -hmm. You told me at the, we were walking the dog in the park like a couple of months ago and you were like, what? you know, what do you want for yourself in five years? And I was like, well, I want to have, you know, a, a good family life and I want to have a career that's meaningful and, you know, good generic answers. But you were like, oh, so you have feminine goals. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I guess. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, <laughs> well, that fit, that fits very well with the story I yeah, just told. I'm a, too, a high achieving woman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that could be worse. Could be worse. Yeah. yeah no, I'm happy up, about that. I wasn't offended. I just up in was a little surprising. When you're Forty. Well, I mean, time will tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do, please keep that private. <laughs> well, yeah. I won't, I won't be keeping that private. <laughs> oh, that's uh, funny. And, anyway, um, my point was, I guess. Do you have advice for younger people about how to like, are you happy that you're settled down now with a kid and yeah, for sure. There's, has well, I wouldn't really have it freedoms or anything. Well, yeah, obviously in some ways it's limited freedoms. Um, but well, I feel like when you get into your late twenties or even mid twenties, you've probably been partying and doing random stuff and living with roommates for quite a few years already. You know, I mean, it, it, it doesn't, I don't think it remains interesting for that long. And even with, you know, people I know that are around the same age, everyone at around this age, or not everyone, but a lot of people end up settling down to a certain extent. And whether that's, you know, it's needing a change of some kind, whether it's deciding to travel the world or switch careers or go back to school or something, you, you can't just stay on the same kind of young person schedule forever. Um, and well, I found someone who I fell in love with and I always was attracted to women who wanted a family and I always, I always wanted a family. And so it, it fit in well for me. And I think that's fairly uncommon with young well, men. Do you think, do you I mean, my, one of my observations of you, and now you were very private, so I don't know all the details, thank God, <laughs> is that you tended to mostly have long-term, pretty committed relationships. Yeah. And do you know, that was the case with me too, generally speaking. Do you think that was associated with this conscious desire to have a family? I don't even know if it was. I think that I, well, I normally just chose women, girls that I liked. <laughs> Plus, what do you want to go out with a girl who's like, I hate children? That's super attractive. Well, I never so, want to be like, I'm just, that just shouts infertile. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not so bad if you don't want children and if you only re regard them as an impediment. But if you're shouting it, that's definitely a problem. Yeah. That's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. If you're shouting that on the street, probably you should be yeah. best avoided. But I don't know. It was just, it's just kind of how it worked out for me. And, and, um, well, I was really lucky. You know, I met someone who I was extremely compatible with very young and our relationship yeah. has only improved with time. How did you know, how did you know that that was going to work out? Well, I didn't and we had ups and downs, right? Like we, well, yeah, we had our ups and downs and I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't know until, really until we were married, I guess. Weirdly mm -hmm. enough, like. Maybe not. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe that's fairly normal. But, but even when we were engaged, you know, I feel like we were still kind of feeling each other out to see if it was really the, the right path. Um, and you know, we went through growing pains and all sorts of things that, that all couples go through. We fought a lot at times and, but the, the thing that I guess made me realize that it was, you know, a relationship that was built to last was that every time we did our relationship improved, mm, right. Yeah. And then it was happening right, less so and less. Whether you fight, it's whether you reconcile. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. what it's all about, That's, right? It's, yeah, it's all about finding someone that is willing to put in the effort to improve the relationship, you know, over the years because people change and their needs change and their interests change. And you have to have a partner that's willing to listen and, and keep up with you, right? As Are you, you as good you at negotiating? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, that's one of the things that we practiced a lot as kids, right? Yeah. And that was one of the things that made our childhood somewhat unique, I would say, was that we spent a lot of time being taught to negotiate. And so, yeah, it's definitely one of my one of the skills that I'm, that's very useful in relationships, I guess, that I have. <laughs> and useful in other ways? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did, I got a question. A curse leaps to mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you have arguments and negotiate, we had a podcast last year with an FBI negotiator mm -hmm. and his take was that you either agree to something and the other person kind of meets you there but you don't meet in the middle 
What's your take on that? Like when you guys have disagreements, are there things where you're like, okay, I'll give a little and she'll give a little and then- Yeah, I think eventually that's what happens. But I think that when you- I think it's a Hegelian synthesis. <laughs> yeah, I also don't know what that means. <laughs> well, <laughs> how did you know? Yeah. Antithesis. Right. Synthesis. Yeah. Okay. Not negotiated metal. Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's, so that's what I was going to yeah. say. Uh, Obviously. Sure. Yeah. I was going to use exactly the same Hegel words too. Yeah. Yeah. Were you? Yeah. Hegelian yeah. synthesis? Yeah. And there's no yeah. way of knowing that I wasn't going to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, basically, you know, you, I think I feel like oh, one person has to basically give in a little bit at the beginning. Yeah. Well, and then, and then the other person will meet you somewhere along the way eventually once, once, the, once the negativity or the emotion goes out of the situation. Right. I, I think it's very uncommon that people reconcile at exactly the same time. Right. It's almost always one person decides that it's, you know, either understands what they've done to contribute or is willing to put that aside in order for, you know, to have a real communication with the other person. Um, and then, you know, and then once the, once the emotion calms down and, and people can see more clearly, then you meet somewhere down the road, I guess. Down the road. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that initial willingness to give in isn't that. It's, I'm willing to change as a consequence, consequence of this conflict. Now, that means I haven't specified the direction of change, but you, you would do that hoping that you could both attain something better as a consequence of the negotiation. Yeah. And you can, almost inevitably. And that's what you can aim for. It's like, let's make this better. Not average, not, you know, miserable in the middle, but be better for both of us. That's the point of a successful negotiation. It also means that the negotiated agreement will be stable. Because if you have to give in, let's say, and compromise, well, then you're not really pursuing what you want to pursue. And so you're going to work at a counter position to that subtly and maybe not so subtly. But if you see, oh, this is this solution that we both generate is way better than either of the things we were doing before, that'll just sustain yeah. itself. One, one person has to trust that the other person is going to do the same thing, right? I think that's where yeah. it is because people fight, like a, an actual fight in a relationship, when the trust disappears about something, right? Yeah. You, either, you know, you, you assume that the other person isn't going to be able to move past it in some way or isn't going to be able to apologize in a meaningful way or whatever or it is. Or they were motivated in a way that wasn't... Right. It was in untrustworthy in some way. Yeah, that's right. That's um, right. It is. And then, you know, it's one person at least has to decide that there's a, you know, a, a spark of trust that will come back, right? Yeah, that's in, kind in, of in that area. The other cheek thing yeah, exactly. And, and you there. don't have to think that the other person's right or anything. You just have to think that they are willing to actually come to a compromise of some yeah, kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A solution. And go, yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, one of the things that your mom and I have going for us is that fundamentally we trust each other like i really trust her to do her best to do the right thing you know and that can be rocky on the road there but i know she's she's working man she's working and hopefully she feels the same about me and so you know we decided when we got together i had already decided that i was going to try to not live by lies let's say at that point, and I'd made a concerted effort to do that for a number of years. And when we first got together, that was part of our agreements, like no lies. And I don't, I don't, I don't think your mother's ever lied to me. So she really stuck to it, man. Once she said she, that was what she was going to do, she. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's when she commits to something, she's committed and that was so useful especially when things got really rocky in our lives when you were sick and when i was sick and when she was sick because <laughs> because we could trust each other you weren't sick i was just off what the, the side wrong with you it's like i'm not sick look at me over here like, we don't have time to look at you <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right yeah, yeah. yeah. no well, i told you that when you were i don't know how old you were 10 something like that when Michaela got so sick, I, I remember talking to you and saying, look, kiddo, we're up to our neck here and you're going to have to be sensible. And you were. It was, it was cool. <laughs> you almost got a tear. Well, I wouldn't oh, be <laughs> <wait. a> tear. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Me and my feminine temperament. <laughs> my feminine goals, your feminine temperament. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Wow. I'm glad I'm sitting out of the 
out of the pokes for this podcast. <laughs> I'll sit here quietly. Uh, I guess we could. I think you were too hard on yourself about relationships there, kiddo, earlier. Comparing yourself with Julian. <laughs> That seems like a backhanded compliment. <laughs> <It's an insult. laughs> Torn too. I feel like I just, I, I just meant in comparison to me. I didn't, I'm not hard on my, I don't think I did something necessarily. I think I did my best. Yeah. We're in, there were some extenuating circumstances over here. Yeah. So I'm like, it just didn't turn out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you also had good relationships in the past. It's not like you've had terrible relationships that's not how it's going no yeah. yeah no no it was hard yeah so it has been hard yes anything you're interested oh in i have another well? question too though okay I, you go first well uh, you did the, the most protracted writing you did was your thesis mm -hmm. so why did you pick the topic and what did it do for you to write that what and what did it teach you about writing and yeah well when i was in my fourth year of university i was pursuing a music minor and and writing my thesis. I was actually taking, I think I was taking six courses, working two jobs and writing my thesis. That was too much. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting, right? I mean, and one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the things that you always say to people, but you said to us as kids was, you know, it's useful to see how far you can, you know, see how much you can work, right? And see where your limits are to a certain extent. And that was one of the things that it did to me that, or for me that year. Was that I was I was really going at, at full full capacity uh, doing all those things um, and it, well it was great it was writing a thesis was definitely the most meaningful part of my university experience um, and I chose the thing that I did be, part, partly because it was very interesting to me you know to go back to uh, what we were talking about earlier about finding a topic that compels you it's I, I thought it was um, I'd been reading a lot of Heidegger because that was part of the degree uh, that I was doing was focused on kind of that era of philosophers. And I found his philosophy extremely interesting. Uh, and then I was also reading Terence McKenna uh, at that time. You would give me a few books that were uh, about the psychedelic experience. and Like fathers do. Yeah, that's a normal thing. That people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I kept seeing parallels and maybe that was the psychedelics, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, <laughs> I decided they were really there. Um, and, um, and so I just wanted to explore that because I didn't feel like it had ever been explored properly, uh, that relationship between, you know, a fairly mainstream, I suppose. Well, yeah, mainstream yeah. philosopher and, and kind of out there thinkers like Terence McKenna or like, um, yeah, the other, the other thinkers that I integrated into that paper, um, and it was just yeah, we're going. I wanted to do something a psychedelic unique. reading list pretty soon. We are We've yeah. got about fifty books on that. So is that it's about paper, ready to go? Like, could that paper be put up online so people could read it? It could. I'll I'll put it in the essay app. <laughs> yeah, that, I think you should put it. In, didn't we decide that you were going to put it in the essay app? Yeah, that probably needs to be edited. Oh God. Yeah. Well, use the essay. <laughs> use essay. Then. Use essay. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah. It's pretty good. Uh, what is essay, Julian? Uh, essay is a writing platform that I've been working on for the last couple of years um, that basically turns um, dad's writing philosophy uh, that he used to teach to his students and continues to talk about into uh, a web app that's usable for the average writer and makes it easier to follow the philosophy and, um, and learn to write. So where did this come from? You said dad's philosophy. Where did essay come from? Yeah, so uh, there was this document that Dad produced um, for his university students a long time ago. I don't know exactly when it was. 15, 15 years ago. Yeah, 15 probably. years ago. Um, and he would give this to first year and second year students to help them structure their essays because most first and second year university students don't really know how to write very well. Um, and they've, they've never been taught by someone who knew to, how to write. So maybe they were taught grammar in an artificial manner, but... I looked at how I was grading essays and then formalized it. And I realized I was grading word choice, phrase choice, phrase organization within sentences, sentence organization within paragraphs, paragraph organization within chapters, and then the impact of the whole. I thought, well, that's also how I edit. And so I wanted to write a practical writing guide, not, not one that focused specifically on grammar. And yeah. so... When Julian and I started talking about this, first we were going to just publish the 
essay guide, which we did, we made that available freely online. But then we were thinking through the problem of how to teach people to write. And the hard thing about that is that usually people write and then sub submit it for grading. And that's extremely expensive and cost and time intensive. So yeah, so basically we were attempting to turn this document into something that people could use and they could improve their writing in a more structured manner. Um, but that it would be more natural than reading a document and trying to you know, do it in that way and taking bits out of the document and trying to integrate that philosophy into their writing. Um, and so we did a number of iterations uh, trying to turn it into, instead of kind of a step-by-step -step guide, a more kind of contained application that would integrate the philosophy and the tools uh, that were written in the document into something that you could just use and it felt natural. Um, and as you were writing, you could kind of integrate these practical tools and it would just come together and improve. Yeah. Instead of writing in a word processor and referring to this document, we just integrated the two so that you can, so that you can write and focus at different levels of analysis with each tool. And so there's a tool that is optimized for producing a first draft where you just read what you need to read and take your notes, watching what you think and maybe thinking out loud and trying to capture that loosely as rapidly as possible. And then there are other tools that follow on from that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically we split it out into the produce tool, the outline tool, the rewrite tool and reorder. Uh, and basically the structure that someone's supposed to follow when they're using this app is they, uh, they outline their essays, they decide what they're going to write about. And it doesn't have to be an essay. It could be a document. It could be an email to somebody. Um, and so you basically come up with your main idea and then you break it down into subtopics. Um, and then you go to the produce tool and that's where you're supposed to kind of fill in your ideas in a rough way, which is what dad was talking about. You just kind of write and you're not supposed to edit. You're not supposed to do anything. You're just supposed to get your ideas on paper um, try to use the research that you've done and produce whatever you're able to produce. Yeah. A loose, a loose first draft. Yeah. People often try to write a good word and a good phrase and a good sentence in a good paragraph right during the first draft so that when they're done drafting it once they're finished. And mm. the problem with that is it's actually way more work because you can't do all of that at once. And trying to just makes it almost impossible for you to think what you want to do is well, first, you want to ask yourself a question that you really want to have the answer to. So you have to be motivated. And that's an important first choice. Even if you're writing a Yikes. document that someone wants you to write, you have to find a handle on it that you're compelled by. And that should be statable in the form of a question. What question are you essaying, which means attempting to answer? It should be one you have a reason to answer. And then you break it down, as Julian said, by the outline. Well, what topics are you, subtopics are you going to hit? Outline topics are you going to hit while walking through this? And that's a preliminary plan, you know, because you're going to reorganize at the level of the outline too. And then maybe you go do your reading or your thinking. And while you're doing that, note what you're thinking and write it down. Say it out loud. Capture it. Don't edit. Capture. And so maybe you're aiming to produce one and a half or times or two times as much written material as you'll need in the final analysis. Now, people don't like doing that because they fall in love with, they write, with what they write and it's hard to do it, they think. But it's way easier to just give yourself the freedom to jot down and note everything you're thinking. And then, well, then you go into the, well, the next tools. Yeah, and basically the next tools are editing tools. And so the idea that we made, or that we tried to capture in this tool is to allow people to produce variations of their writing and to quickly restructure it. So like variations of sentences or paragraphs? Or yeah, what? variations of sentences first. And so what you'd do cool. if you were writing a relatively long piece in this is you'd go through it sentence by sentence. And we have a tool that shows you your full documents on one side and then a broken down version of it sentence by sentence on the other side. Uh, cool. And basically you can go one by one through your sentences, produce as many variants as you want, and then see them in context to your document. Okay. So that's a Darwinian approach to creative thinking. So because in the Darwinian evolutionary process, creatures generate variants, that's mutation and, and, and sexual recombination. And then the environment selects from among those variants for the most, for the most fit 
the the uh, particulars that are most fit at that time. So this tool, it'll show you your sentence. Correct me if I get this technically wrong. It'll show your sentence. You click on it, it'll duplicate the sentence. And then you can write a variant of that sentence. You can do that indefinitely. And then what you want to do, write shorter sentences, longer sentences. Shorter is usually better. People can improve their essays radically, usually by cutting the sentence length by 15%. That's a good first pass attempt. But you look at all these variants, choose the variant that's better and substitute it. You do that with every sentence. That's fine-grained editing, not as fine-grained as word choice, but you'd be doing some of that at that point as well. How much can you put into this? Like, could you edit a book? Theoretically, you could edit a book. Um, it would help in some ways because we have the outline tool, which allows you to quickly jump through your document. Um, we've had some... So what do you mean? Well, in the outline work? tool, you have written your subtopics and then what it shows under each subtopic is a truncated version of each paragraph that you have within the subtopic. And so it'll oh. show like, um, cool. I don't know, a five or six sentence or not even probably a four, four sentence version. So you can quickly toggle through your essay. And so it'll oh. get an overview of get it. an overview and you can click to scroll uh, and it, it really allows you to navigate a, a relatively long document pretty quickly. Yeah, likely what would happen is if you're writing a book, you'd use it for each chapter yeah, and, then, and rewrite the okay. chapters and then maybe use a standard word processor to move the chapters around. Depends on how long the book is. But for lengthy essays, even multi-part essays with multiple subtopics, it'll work just fine. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. That seems... Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, we can return to the original, let's call it principles of writing. You remember when you're thinking about a document, you think you build it word up but that's or do you build it letter up i hope not right yeah right exactly well by by the time you write you've already automated the letter <laughs> typing process right so but then you have to think about the word and the phrase and the sentence and the paragraph and the paragraph sequence and the subtopic sequence and the tool is designed to help you learn to think like that at multiple levels of analysis. Well, and so you don't have to think like that. That's kind of the point of it, right? Is to yes, break the thinking break out down. into software so that you naturally think that way when you're writing. Yeah. Um, and so and that, that's how you thought writing. That's how you write, right? Well, it was an iterative process because while I was grading and then trying to teach people to write, I was thinking about well, what am I doing when I'm grading? Now, I'd already written a lot by then, but it wasn't until I wrote this document that I really started to understand this idea of multi-level, simultaneous multi-level processing, which has been very useful for other things I've been thinking through. It's like, well, where's the meaning when you read? Well, is it in the words, the phrases, the sentences, the sentence organization, the paragraphs, etc.? I don't walk through that again. And the answer is it's all of those simultaneously. And it's even broader than that because you might think, well, the essay as a whole, that's a level of analysis. But there's an e the broadest possible level of analysis. But it's not. The question you're asking is broader level because the essay for it to be a real product, a product of your imagination and thought that will be useful to you practically and also psychologically, let's say, it has to address something that you regard as important or the whole bloody exercise is a lie. And well, I would recommend if you're bored by what yeah. you're writing, then you haven't, you're not trying to write a, the right, you're not trying to answer the right question or you haven't formulated the right question. What do you do though? This is just side note. What do you do if you're in high school or university and you're assigned a topic? You find an angle that makes you interested in it. You have to wrestle with yourself to begin with. Maybe you write, write something critical. When I think it's well, a rare teacher that if you suggest something that's similar that you are interested in, they'll say no. You know, I think... Okay, so that's a... Try that maybe. I think well, generally that's... try to write something, you know, approach your teacher and say, you know, I'm actually interested in, in exploring this topic. If the teacher says you're not allowed to explore a topic you're interested in, then they're probably not a very good writing teacher and maybe you don't care about <laughs> how they feel about <laughs> well, your writing. Maybe, well, yeah, and that's an important point. Oh, it's that's like, a good point. It is a good point, man. It's like, don't let people mess with your words. Yeah. And you don't, it, you don't want to lose the, you know, if you do enjoy writing, you don't want to have that taken away from you by someone who's going to put you in a box that you don't want to be in. Yeah, yeah and so I if, like if you really hate the topic, write something that's subtly satirical <laughs> or over the top. Like you have, look, man, writing is hard work. It's hard, just like thinking. But it's not as hard as doing neither. 
because then you're a mess. You're anxious and you're, and you're without purpose and goal and you're inarticulate and you're weak. You lose. And I don't mean in a you win and someone else loses manner. I mean in an everyone loses manner. And so when you sit down to write or think, you have to be motivated. And if you're not, you're not doing it right. And that's writing teachers should stress that above all else. You know, they should help their students identify something that they can hardly wait to write about because it's so important to them. Well, then you've got the motivation and each word starts to matter because your life depends on it. And if you think your life doesn't depend on your words, you just don't know anything about words. And so it is definitely the case. Let's take a business example. If you're constantly being forced, forced to write things that grate against your conscience or that you find yourself bored to death by, then it's either time to stand up and say something and then you should use the writing program to figure out what you're going to stand up and say. <laughs> or it's time to get a new job, in which case you should use the writing program to put your CV and your resume together and maybe write yourself something like a statement of purpose. Like This is no game. If writing is thinking, which it is, and thinking sets your life in order or not, then you don't let people mess with your words. You want to get them in order like soldiers. And that's partly what this writing program is designed to help people do. Now, it's not so much we're trying to teach people to write. We're trying to facilitate their thought and their clarity of communication. And writing, this is another thing that isn't taught well to students. Well, why should I learn to write? Well, how else are you going to communicate pe with people as you ascend up a hierarchy of competence? Like some of the toughest mm -hmm. guys I know, Jocko Willink, for example, you know, lays tremendous stress on literacy. Even as a soldier, he had to communicate orders, let's say, to, his, to the people that, that he was in command of, but he also had to communicate up the chain of command. And if your words are well-structured and, and inspired and properly motivated and aimed like an arrow, you're unstoppable. And I don't understand, well, this is, so many people are taught to write by people who don't know how to write or why to write or how to think. And that's partly what we're trying to address here. So we hope people will find it extremely useful. It's also like knowing how to write a good email too, even if you're not interested in essays specifically, knowing how to write a good email can change how a company is run. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Well, it can change people's lives, right? You need to write an email to someone you want to get a job from or, mm -hmm. or a landlord to try to get them to not increase your rent or like, you know what right. I mean? Or like, a city councilman <laughs> to try to get them to do something that needs doing in your neighborhood or a yeah. politician to get them to change a law. You're going to be you're going to be making your case in front of people badly or well your entire yeah. life. Yeah. And so I don't know why we don't teach people that this arms them. Well, we won't use that language, right? Because we think everyone should be cooperative, and yeah, yeah it's it's a, it's a complete bloody mess. But we we did decide though. We've been trying to crack the problem of scaling education, and we have a bunch of ideas about that. And Julian and I were working on a broader online university project when I got extremely ill and it folded back into this writing program, which turned out in some ways to be an okay thing because this is actually, it, it had, hopefully it will address a very serious issue. In and we could do it instead of the other one, which... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The other one was pretty broad. It was, Too yeah. broad. Yeah. Better break which it is down why it to, failed probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, part of the reason. It hasn't failed yet. It's just been sequenced differently. Yeah, fair enough. So, so there's an academy you, is coming. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. And we're we have online courses, and we're working with people in the broader educational sphere. So who knows what'll happen? You should talk about the design a little bit because it's quite elegant. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we spend a ton of time building the design out. I mean, we did a number of iterations at the beginning um, that were very, very different. Um, my wife's a product designer, um, and I'm a front-end developer. And so we're both very concerned with UX and making things that people can use naturally and that feel good to use. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people don't like to write. And that's an issue, right? Is if we want people to write and we want people to learn to write better and think better, uh, then when you go into a new application that you have to learn, it has to be very comfortable. Uh, and so we wanted to make the design very modern, very clean, 
uh, very intuitive. Yeah, self-explanatory, right? Because a hallmark of good design is that you don't have to refer to a manual to figure out how to use, let's say, the tools. And mm -hmm. Well, the and these are different things, right? We're, we're trying to teach people to interact with a word processor differently, which is a big ask in yeah. a way to the user, right? And because... Well, because almost everyone writes using something, right? And people use Word or Google Docs Google or Docs. whatever, right, so whatever they use. We have to make it easier for them to write using this, at least easier. Well, given the payoff has trying, to be there. Well, that's right, the payoff right. also has to yeah. be there. Because there's ease a bit more work. Really it's not just a blank sheet. So right. There's more work. You to actually it, do have to learn to use you. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it, but theoretically and. From our experience, the tools are, are worth the learning curve. And we've well, tried to make the learning curve as minimal as possible using good design. Well, right. The, the other thing we did, and, and this is a design element too, is that while you're using, while you're learning to use the tools, you're also learning how to go about thinking at the same time. So you're not only learning how to use the writing program, you're learning how to think about thinking. And that's extremely important just knowing for example that you do multi-level processing and that you can edit and reconceptualize at all those levels that's extremely useful formally to know about how you think and why you think yeah so, what's a nice thing about the tools in general is that they're not they're not specific tools to the app right like you can you can use them in context of the app but if you're writing an email in you know just in your in gmail or whatever then you can still go through it and improve the sentences and improve the structure of the paragraphs and you can use the tools that you've built and practiced using the and application. Now internalize. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And you can use them exactly. wherever and you can use them, yeah, when you're thinking or talking as well, you know, in a sort of faster way, but it, they're, they're generally useful things to understand and, and, and. Right. So my impression know. going through, I kind of had to learn to use this app in the last few months, because although I was involved in the design to begin with, when I got sick, I, I forgot a lot of what the app did and why it was produced the way it was. And so I've had to relearn it learn how to use it over the last couple of months and it was very straightforward to learn but what was what i was even happier about was the fact that learning to use it does not waste effort you know if you learn a program like photoshop you can use photoshop the photoshop skills you've learned on illustrator and other adobe project products but it doesn't really generalize outside of that domain because oh. the, because these commands are so specific with this you could use essay for a year and then hypothetically never use it again because you could use, you could do what Don't it tell does people in a word that. processor. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, only by the personality test once. Well, I'll say it, never use it again. Learn yeah, not it, need internalize it. it, throw it yeah. away. No, no, I wouldn't recommend that because I think that, <laughs> I think that once you use it, this guy's also, not in our marketing team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll also find it a good place to keep track of your essays and all of that, to build an essay bank. And we're going oh, to build... Oh, that's cool. That's mm -hmm. a good idea. Yeah. So so we, we've thought about the, well, the problem of what do you do with what you've written? And that's also relevant to something mentioned earlier. If you write an essay and your first draft is twice as long as it needs to be, and you cut a bunch of it out, keep what you've cut in another document because yeah. I've almost never written anything that was wasted it might not have been useful precisely in the context that i wanted it for at that moment but keeping a log or a collection of written material especially yeah. by topic is extremely useful as you progress through your life and you'll find a use oh, for it man. okay I've, it's useful for writers it's also you know i play music and i've done that with songs too right you can write song lyrics and just write poetry or whatever you're writing. Yeah. And then you can, you know, that's how a lot of great songs have been written. P little pieces here and there of different, you know, thrown away songs that yeah, people the Beatles still get. Yeah, yeah, the Beatles did it all the time. But yeah, so it's not just, not just for writing, I, but for artistic it's been my things as well, that often. No genuine work is wasted. It just doesn't fit necessarily with exactly what you're doing at the moment. But, but first of all, the skills you learn while you're genuinely working generalize. And also the products, if you keep them, I had a, some poems I wrote, horrible poems about children, um, 15 years ago. We don't need ago. context for that. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. They're funny. So they're funny. Yeah. I was, it was when I was doing my clinical work and I needed to blow off some steam about all the awful things I was seeing. So thank you very much. In any case, I wrote those 15 years ago. It wasn't till this year that we started working on having them illustrated and a whole creative, a whole sequence of creative projects emerged mm. from that. So you have to realize that when you're writing, you are literally changing your brain. 
So be so, careful about what you write about. As that's well. for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do, like truth <laughs> all the way. Down. Well, it depends. You want your? Do you want to program in garbage? Because you're actually producing automated circuits in your brain when you write. And so, if you write something you don't agree with, you can do that as an exercise to stretch out your intellectual imagination, right? And to develop your argument, let's say, and the contrary argument as part of thinking. But if you write a bunch of lies for someone that you don't trust to do something you don't like, that will change you in that direction. If you do that a hundred times, you'll be way different than the person you were. And in, you may be bored, miserable, angry, unhappy, resentful, amotivated, um, tendentious, inarticulate. But otherwise fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't mess with your words, man. The point you made earlier, I hadn't actually thought about this. I've, I've got an issue storing way too many Google Docs and Sheets and Google Google has a like, terrible storage Google Drive. Yeah. Right. So the fact that you can actually store focus pieces of writing, that's, that's pretty interesting. Instead of putting all your spreadsheets and everything in one area, mm -hmm. you could put everything that you focus on in one area and then look back on it. Yeah, well, Google it's Drive is like obviously a, great, nice. but it's because everything is there. And that, yeah, you know, that comes just, with, any loose with the cost, yeah. with the cost, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you that, lose things all the time there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not something that we've solved completely with this program, but it is a good place to store the things that you've endeavored to write. So. Hmm. Cool. There's, we have what, three patents pending yes. on it? Yes. So that's fun. You know, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a. So it's still stealable. <laughs> is what we're saying. It's still stealable. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, on that, you know, virtually everything is stealable. And the way you succeed in the marketplace is becoming getting there fairly early and then making a product that's better than everyone else's and then keeping it better. If you want to rely on legal protection, even patents, it'll just wear you to a frazzle. It's not the, I mean, look, you have to keep people from stealing your intellectual property and patent protection and legal protection can help. But in the final analysis, the way that you remain competitive in the marketplace is to stay not only ahead of your competitors, but ahead of your previous product. Right. And so otherwise you get into this defensive mode where you're fending everyone else off, trying to protect your thing. It's like your thing, the thing you developed in all likelihood is alive and you should stay on the cutting edge of its development. But it's still nice to have the patents. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> they're hard to enforce. You Pending. have to take them out in all sorts of different countries. You know, you get tangled up with lawyers, but it's no one wants that. No one wants that. Yeah. yeah, no lawyers can use our program. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. Lawyers are very useful in their proper place, <laughs> 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 which is definitely not everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, how does that work for running out trauma? Then, isn't it because it's supposed to be therapeutic? But how is it not strengthening memories associated with trauma? If you're that's an excellent question. And there's actually a whole research literature on that, which we drew on when we formulated the self-authoring program, especially the past authoring yeah. program. Well, James Pennebaker tested that. So imagine two theories. One is just write down everything that you can remember about the trauma and cry and be miserable and yeah. depressed while you do that. And that's cathartic. Okay. But then imagine that you write down everything you remember around the trauma, and then you go through a process like you would go through with our writing tool where you organize it and you, you reduce it and you make it clear and comprehensible and you weave it into a narrative and you strip the emotion out of it while you're doing that yeah. because you start to understand what happened. And it isn't catharsis. Yeah. James Pennebaker tested this. So he had people write about their traumatic experiences. It usually made them feel worse for a two week period afterwards. But yeah. six months later, they had visited the physicians far less frequently. So it's out of tyranny into the desert and then into the promised land, right? So there's a cost that you pay when you first confront things that you'd rather avoid. And that's obviously because why would people avoid them if there was no cost? And you might say, well, that's dangerous. And ruminating involuntarily on traumatic experiences doesn't help get rid of them. You have to confront them voluntarily. And then it isn't expression of emotion that cures right. you. It's organization of the memories into a narrative that specifies the causal pathway. Why did this happen? When it happened? Why did it happen to me? And then is associated with 
rectification of that vulnerability. And so Pennebaker tested, did people use more words indicative of expressed emotion? Or did they use more words that were indicative of cognition and comprehension? And which of those predicted the best outcome? So like, like what? Understand, comprehend, came yeah. to know. Okay. Angry, sad, hurt, upset on the other side. The more their written product revealed the cognitive processing, the better the effect of the traumatic narration. And you see this, you see this when you talk to people who have had a traumatic experience, if you, if you talk to them carefully and listen carefully as they work through it. So they, they want to know exactly what happened in detail so that maybe they can set up their lives so that won't happen again. So, you know, you were traumatized as a child, but you're a lot easier to take advantage of in your, if you're a child. Now you have all those memories about yeah. being hurt. Okay. As the person comes to understand their trauma, the time it takes to recount it shrinks dramatically. Yeah. And that means they've, they've pulled out the gist, right? The central issues from the experience. And they can use that as a practical guide to the future. That is exactly what you're doing, by the way, when you're writing an essay. You think, well, it's not a trauma. It's like, well, if you pick a question that's interesting to you, it's interesting because the fact that you don't know it is a problem. And so one of the great ways to figure out what to write about is, well, what bugs you? Notice that. That's that involuntary rumination. That's the manifestation of underlying complexes from a psychoanalytic perspective. So something's on your mind, poking you, bugging you. It's like Jiminy Cricket in, in Pinocchio. That is really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did it, man. I knew that would bug you. So it was supposed to, you know, it was, so anyways, you find, you find something that bugs you. That's your problem. You might say, well, why should I have a problem? It's like, hey, it picked you. It's your problem. It's your destiny. It's something you, that would compel you to solve. It's your adventure. Your adventure can be found in what bothers you and won't go away. Well, that's your topic, man. That's your life. Delve into that and use this program because it'll help you <laughs> figure that out. It'll help you figure that out. Write about things that matter. You say, well, my life has no meaning. Nothing I write is meaningful. Well, you're not writing about something that matters to you. And that first step that we talked about, when you specify the question, the program says this quite clearly, specify the question you're trying to answer. You have to want the answer. You want to be motivated to write. It's like, this is a hot question for me, man. I'm going to go read some things about it because I need to know. Well, that's what you want to write about. That's where you find your, find your passion to use an overworked cliche. Okay, well... Cheers, guys. That was fun. Cheers. You bet. Cheers. And here's to finally having this conversation. Yeah. And being able to have it. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. Oof.